This is the Content at AI podcast, episode number 21. It's easy to get caught up in the frenetic pace of generative AI technology adoption, unless you've already created rituals to help slow your life down. Elizabeth Beasley created her Peaceful Wednesday ritual 10 years ago to bring some calm to her increasingly fast-paced work life. That practice is serving her well now, as she and her colleagues at Intuit developed their approach to incorporating AI tools while continuing to deliver trustworthy experiences. Welcome to the Content and AI Podcast, where experts on artificial intelligence share their wisdom with the content community. Our mission is to demystify and democratize AI, to make its principles and practices accessible to all content practitioners. And now here's your host, Larry Swanson. Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode number 21 of the Content and AI podcast. I am really happy today to welcome to the show uh, Elizabeth Beasley. Elizabeth is a senior content designer at Intuit, the big financial software company. Uh, Welcome, Elizabeth. Tell the folks a little bit more about what you're up to these days. Hey, it's so fun to be here. Um, I am, yes, I'm at Intuit. Financial services is my life lately. And um, it's I've worked in a kind of a fun space. I think it's fun security identity. Um, I always tell like describe it to my mom or my friends of like I do the part where you create your account, you sign back into your account, you manage your account, and I make that easy for you with content design. Um, they still don't quite understand that, but that's the space I work in, and I really um, surprisingly enjoy it. I, I worked in banking previously and got into like security, and now I'm I'm sort of obsessed with like security and identity and fraud, and it's um. It's it's a fun, exciting space to work. And also, I love it because everyone uses it. So it's very, um, very relatable and it affects like many, many people. So it has a lot of impact. Right. You can't do anything until you get past that experience that you're designing. <laughs> then you're in and then you can start doing stuff. But yeah. you, you sort of established your cred. You're, you're not like some kind of a Luddite about technology. You clearly you're deep in it every day doing that. And yet, the reason we connected, the reason I wanted to have you on the show is that we connected, I think, on LinkedIn. I can't even remember exactly how it started, but but you're sort of like a, a slower adopter of AI technologies. And I was like, perfect. I want to get her on the show because... Every twenty of the every one of the twenty episodes before this, we're all and I'm as you know as into it as them, just deep into the technophilia and the all the new work things around AI. And you're more like, you know, yeah, it's great, and you're studying it, you're staying on top of it, but you're not like um, uh, just diving in, like with both feet, fangirl about it. Tell me a little bit about how that that uh, perspective arose. Yeah, I, it, it is. I feel I'm, sometimes I feel like I'm behind, but then I'm like, I'm just a late adopter. It's okay. I'm a late bloomer. Um, and I think it's partly because I, I've i seen technology changes before. And I worked in television for like the first 20 years of my career. And, um, you know, wh- I mean, watch changes even basically from like tape to digital. And that really changed people's jobs. And the biggest one, though, that makes me think of, of the way AI was going is, um, streaming services, streaming video. Um, I worked in a TBS and, you know, we made that transition from like weird cable network to panicking because everything was streaming. And there was like, there was a whole TV everywhere initiative where, you know, the cable networks are trying to get you to watch their stuff on multiple devices. And that was kind of the beginning. And we were trying to figure out what does that mean? What does that mean for our jobs? And, you know, we have to produce things everywhere. Um, It was, and it was intense and stressful and scary. And, then, you know, fast forward 20 years and I'm looking at it thinking like, huh, that didn't turn out like I thought, um, you know, it, it's, it evolved. Streaming is now actually a lot like cable television again. I was like telling someone, I was like, this is funny because now you go to Hulu and you can add channels and build your own, you know, cable service. Um, so I think the thing that I'm taking away is like, you know, it's kind of a long game. And if you get stressed at the beginning, kind of burn yourself out and, you know, create panic and you don't really need that like in your life so i'm trying to relax into it and just sort of you want to you know be, be aware and learn but i'm like also like you know what i want to see how other people are using it what what how is this going to turn out what's the best thing for us and um and particularly with ai which is to me radically different because there's these moral and ethical parts of it that i don't think we have had to like i haven't had to wrestle with in technology before it, before it was more like is this helpful? But this is more like, oh no, is this going to be bad? Um, so you know, it's a it's a little bit more weight as well if you adopt 
you know, early and kind of get in there. So I'm just, I, I like to play the kind of watch and see where this goes and where do I need to jump into the game? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you've, I love that you have the the credibility of having been through this kind of thing before. And as you're talking about, it, I was thinking back like 20, 25 years ago, I remember just fighting constantly with marketing people who wanted to violate people's privacy. And like Seth Godin had come along and said, you know, permission-based parking, that's the way to do it. And, and that's kind of like convention today and all the laws and regulations do that. But we don't have that now. Like AI is still like the wild west. It's still un- unfolding really quickly um, do you see like when you look at like looking, especially with that lens of like your TV history, I love that perspective on this. Are you starting to see any things that like you're really paying attention to? Like this might be the thing that we look back and go like, boy, that was the wrong thing to worry about. Mm, that's a really good question. Um, I think I, I'm kind of, Gen I is, is curious to me because I, I talked to a teammate yesterday and She's like, I just don't want to release it till it's reliable. And I was like, yeah, that's the name of the game, right? Um, you know, getting res- reliable results. And so a lot of times I'm just wondering, I know we're excited about it and we sometimes want to just, let's use it. Like it's, I was, it's akin to sort of like, I got this new chainsaw and I need to paint the house. I'll use the chainsaw. And it's like, well, no, that's not the right tool. So really examining like what's the right tool for this job it might be a different form of ai than gen ai um and that's something i'm really conscious of because we get really excited about it and we like let's consider the other ways to solve this problem and find the right solution now certainly we have this new toy let's see if the chainsaw can work but um we might innovate and find a special way to do it but i'm just sort of thinking Let's look. I'm really into the use cases lately. I, I was like, let's look at the use cases and how do we solve this problem, and then really examine if this is the right method. Now, so I, it, sometimes you have to go down the rabbit hole of like trying it and be like, that wasn't the right method, but you know. Yeah, and as you describe it, I think it's like <laughs> the. I, I love that. I'm going to totally steal the chainsaw for painting the house. I <laughs> I love that because that that kind of gets it. You feel like there's some of that going on right now, but I think more of the point is just that like backing away from like that, if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail with with AI technology and thinking back to the fundamentals of like, well, and in your work, like, you know, this is like, there's an interesting confluence to what you were just saying about reliability and your friend's concern about that. And also working in financial services and security in that you you kind of got like a double load of the need for reliability and trustworthiness. is that part of your concern about this? Is like, are you concerned about the trustworthiness of the experiences you're creating? Yeah, absolutely. And you know, you, you just remind me, I am a bit of a risk nerd. I feel like in a previous job when I was at banking, I think I told someone like, I am part of the risk management team because I, I work on, you know, security and stuff like that. Um, so I do take that stuff seriously. And I, I'm always having that lens of, you know, what if we accidentally give someone the wrong information and they, I don't know, make a mistake, lose money, whatever, you know, something bad happens. Um, I don't, I don't, you don't want to be responsible for that. That's, you know, I don't want that to happen for them. And I don't want, you know, to create that possibility. So that's a lens that I'm always looking at is just the, the risk, which is, can, can seem a little pessimistic. You don't always want to go into things like, well, how's it going to turn wrong? But um, it's, I think you should at least look at it, you know, like turn it on that side. No, I appreciate that energy because when you think about like the confluence of like um, Silicon Valley move fast and break things around this new technology, that's sort of the operating paradigm. And, you know, and things like, oh, copyright and privacy and and, and ethics and and inclusion just kind of go out the window because you got to got to ship the next version of your thing. Having risk averse or not risk, you didn't say risk averse, but like risk considerate people like you around seems uh, like... I guess, you know, one of the things that comes has come up a lot in prior conversations around this is the new kinds of collaborators. Like there's all this new kinds of things happening. Are you getting exposed? Like, even though you're not, um, you know, for good reasons, not jumping in with both feet into this, are you finding things around you where things are working differently? You're finding different collaborators, different um, co-conspirators in your, in your design work around, um, you know, yeah. just around AI technology? Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I think we've all experienced, you know, it's it's one of those moments when you've got new technology where you're leaning really hard in with your, you know, engineers and 
other teams and, you know, your legal teams. And, you know, it's a little bit of like, let's all, let's all get in here and look at this. Um, and the risk consideration is really a part of it. And the, yeah, it's, it's, it's more people. It's almost like even on our content design team, our larger team, I feel like we've banded together as a group because remember I mentioned the use cases. Well, I might have security use cases that, uh, that I don't know, something about that essentially someone could use or someone else might have a, a use case that's going to benefit me in a way. So we really need to be sharing those to, to be able to like speed up how we're integrating AI into our work. So, you know, even though if I'm standing back and being kind of like, I'm not sure how to use this, maybe someone else has figured that out. And so I've been trying to go out on these missions of like, let me talk to my friends here and find out what they're doing so that I can gather this knowledge and bring it back. And so it's almost like I'm collecting it. It's the, the late adoption is more of like, I'm in a collection mode and I'm collecting information so that I'll be ready when it's time to go. Um, that's that, super interesting because it's, that's, yeah. that's how I go about it. Yeah, no, as you're saying that, I'm realizing that like, there's, you both are just required to be prudent about this because of the, of the nature of the, of the products you're designing, but also it's sort of, it's, it's a self-reinforcing thing that like, you will then be the person who knows, who's like been outside and hasn't just like got caught up in the rush of it. Um, because it seems to me like one of the things that comes up over and over again around every kind, and even before generative AI, there was in the conversation design world, design world where like, like building Alexa skills and things like that, there was concern about, you know, just the, the, it wasn't hallucination, but just the, the ethical things about like, however those NLP gadgets were to create stuff, these kind of concerns were already there. So it seems like you're in a position to be like maybe in in a weird way you're out ahead of things in terms of like understanding like the the trust mechanisms that need to be in place before you do this. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think you know. Yeah, I, I mean maybe I'll be, be a forerunner and, and by sitting back and, and observing. Um, I do think there's like you know we always talk about like different elevations to look at stuff. So I'm so grateful for my teammates. I mean I do have those teammates who ran forward and are trying everything, and that's you know. I love them and they're the heroes of the story. So I go talk to them all the time. Like, what are you doing? What are you finding out? What's hard? What's easy? Um, you know, is there anything I can do to help you or I'll bring them kind of provocations. And so it is kind of expanding when you talk about the collaborators, expanding the people that you do want to talk to. I mean, I didn't really need to talk to them before because they worked on a different team way far, way far away from me. And now um, we're really having to share knowledge of like uh, between our our content design team on the large scale of like what's happening so we can go speed this up. Um, so it's really, I mean, that makes it really fun too, because you, you're learning as a group. And I think that's another part about a new technology that is fun and scary is you're learning, you know, you get to learn as a group. So you get to struggle as a group and you get to win as a group. And um, that part, I'm enjoying the support. And like immediately yesterday, I just, I had a one-on-one with, with a teammate. Usually they're just supposed to be kind of fun I was like, what are you up to? And we spent 30 minutes digging into like how she's trying to solve an AI problem. And I was like, this is great. This might help me. Let's figure it out. Um, and so that's the stuff I'm really enjoying about it. But I haven't put anything into production yet. I'm just still sort of like learning and and mm -hmm. being in the game. Well, that's really interesting. That makes me wonder about the long-term implications of this because just the very nature of collaborating with other people and new people and different people than you have before, it seems like there's, like, are, are you starting to see any, like just that conversation? It seems like that prompted something you hadn't thought about before, would never have happened before in the normal course of your job. Are you seeing, like, is that something you'll be seeking out more? Or? Yeah, you know, I on a, on a different technology note, I'm working on some things for security and, you know, there's new technology around pass keys and I'm curious about that. So I've been participating in a larger industry group to understand they're all working together on creating some standards, and that's been really fun because you um, you're learning you realize you're learning with you know people from like massive huge companies of what they're doing, and so you know it's a I mean it's definitely a, a specific group, and we you know we know how to manage our information within the group, but you learn a ton, and so it's almost worth getting it's, it's very worth getting involved in this kind of things to get some perspective of what's successful, what's not. Um, it's just been really helpful, especially when you're working in something really brand new and you don't know how you're like, I don't know how this is going to go. So 
And by definition, the brand new thing is the last thing in the world that's going to have standards because nobody's figured out what the standard way of doing things is. Yeah, I mean, we're all creating the standards, right? So um, if that's kind of scary because you're like, oh, no, I'm creating the standards. That's what my my teammate was telling me yesterday. She's like, I was writing some standards. I hope they're I hope they're right, you know, so because um, they have never been done before. So that's the that's again, that's the part I think where I do have the skip. Like, I'm a little scared, but I'm also thoughtful about kind of stepping back and observing. Um, so I'll be ready to go when it's time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that seems like that, that, um, yeah, just being ready. And like you said, like, I think you said something, I can't remember if we've talked about it on, on, in the recording yet, but you said something about holding down the fort that like being that person who's just there doing what's always been done because you still have to do it. Cause that's the business. That's how it's running is like, people are able to securely log into the, into a website. That seems like a, a good thing to be doing. Yeah. Um, yeah, sorry. No, yeah, I mean, it, it was like that when I was talking about the, um, the streaming television example, you know, streaming television started, but you still had cable. So we still had to run this business and then create a new business. And so it feels a lot like that. You know, we still have to run our what we've been doing and then learn this new thing and implement it in and figure out which horse is going to like lead the race one day. Um And, you know, I also think, I mean, I don't like to think about like battle analogies, but like it is, you know, we we, logistically like you don't send all your troops out at once because what if something terrible happens and then you have no one else for like the second second wave. So it's just smart to kind of stagger, you know, let's send these really smart people out front. They'll go learn some stuff that the people back at the fort will like prepare meals and be ready for them to come back and hear the stories about what happened and tell me, tell me what's going on so that when I go, I'll be ready. So it really is a lot like it's like, like that. It's like not an unusual way to think. I didn't, I don't think so. Well, just the way you're describing the dynamics kind of harkens back to something we talked about or before we went on the air about just your curiosity around all this. And like, it's, it's not just um, prudence and caution. It's genuine curiosity about like, and this goes back to your interest in case that use cases and cases that like, what's going to be, where is this going to work best? What's the best way to do things? Yeah. I'm, I'm also you just maybe think I'm also a history buff. So a lot, I think some of that stuff leads into like my approach where you, um, the battle thing, I grew up in the South. There's always, you know, civil war battle stories and how tactics, how things work. And I watched Napoleon recently and I'm watching that. And so you kind of learn these things. And then there's been new technology. If you learn about history, I lived in New England recently and out in the farmland and you look at like all the different tractors they have displayed on their property of, you know, technology has always been changing and it's always been terrifying. And, um, and, you know, I love, you had sent me this thing. I'd always heard of like the early adopter, but you sent me the information about kind of the originator of it. And it was an agricultural study. And I was like, whoa, this is really cool that the farmers who had the most wealth and the biggest farms had a little they could take a risk because they could afford it to try something new. And if it didn't work, it, it was okay because they still had like a really big farm and money. And then, you know, you kind of go over the scale and I'm kind of in the middle where it's like, I have a nice farm. I'm really social. I'm friends with the big farmers, but I kind of take that information back and share it with my medium sized farm friends. And then you have maybe the smaller ones who aren't, don't have the wealth yet. They can't invest in it. So they're like the late adopters because they're just, maybe they can't do it. Maybe they're, they don't have the use case yet because their farm is really small and they don't need the bigger tractor. So just was a really like that analogy. I love analogies, but I was like, whoa. So I was been telling myself like, I'm just a friendly farmer. I'm kind of in the middle, hanging out at the general store, talking about the new things. Yeah, I had forgotten the origins of that analogy when I shared it with you. And it is great because you think about like the farmer who's like, I can't afford one of those fancy new tractors. But man, the guy down the street with the tractor is killing me at the market because he can do things so much more efficiently. And I think we're seeing something analogous with AI right now. Are you hearing stories like I'm trying to think of examples that align with what I just said? Can you think of any? I think there's generally, you know, always a race in business there's a, like, what are the competitors doing? Because we don't want them to beat us um, to the punch, you know, but I also see value. There's, um, you know, if you're the early adopter, I, well, I've been looking at some things, you know, if you go out first and then things change, you're going to have to change your stuff. I've been wondering about that. So um, if you're the first person to do streaming video and then people in six months learn how to do it better, 
you have to t- you've taken the risk of being first. So now you've got to go change everything to catch up to the updates, which is fine. That's like how that works. You have to plan that in. Um, if you wait a little bit, when you go, when you launch, you'll, you'll be like farther down the road. You'll have a little more advanced stuff for people. So it's, it's a, it's a timeline too. I think everybody's going to be shifting on the timeline, right? You'll be launching big things. Someone over here will like, all right, that didn't work. Let's go in with this thing. So I don't know if I didn't know if I described that well, but I just feel like it's um, a 20 year thing. It's a long game. Yeah. And I think between what you just said and what you said earlier about like the old thing is still happening. The new thing is happening. And like, what, how do they happen, you know, at the same time? And, and when do we make the transition? I think that's just a good, a good healthy, you know, I think there's a lot of mindset shift that needs to happen. Like that's one of them is like in the, and this is again, why I was so excited to get you on the show is to talk about this more, you know, like measured, considerate use case backed adoption story instead of like me just jumping into it head first, you know, um, that, that, that seems like a more, I don't know. It just seems like that's that, that, uh, that, that approach that be, that there's having that awareness around your consideration of the adoption seems like a really good take home. I'm thinking also of like, um, friend, um, Nazar Bina had a guy in his podcast a while back and he was talking about the, um, how we've all grown up thinking of computers as these, you know, fantastic, reliable, accurate things that never make mistakes. And it's like, and all of a sudden LLMs and generative uh, pre-trained transformers come along and we're like, whoa, that's different yeah. from the way computers have worked. So there's a lot of mindset shift happening. Yeah, I think, I think so. And, you know, this is a, a kind of a different perspective, but um, when you talk about time and timing and mindset, it's funny that we're, <clears throat> We're recording this on a Wednesday because I started this practice probably, I don't know, 10 years ago when I was super stressed about some something at work that was really fast paced. And like, I was like, I can't do this all. And I started having what I was calling peaceful Wednesday, where I was like, on Wednesdays, nothing can bother me. I will have plenty of time for things. And I kind of intentionally were like, just didn't worry about the time and the speed and the, because it was stress. By the end of the week, I was burnt out. And so I needed to do something in the middle of the week to like, slow down so that I I could make it to Friday. It was that, it was that intense. And I feel like we're at this high intensity thing now where I'm trying to practice this like peaceful Wednesday, but maybe every day where I'm going to not burn myself out and stress about it because that's also, you know, we talk about like our careers as content designers and there's that fear of the technology, but also we could harm ourselves by like burning ourselves out. So I've been looking for ways to reframe it for myself to say, you know what, let's take our, let's take it slow. Let's take some time where we can, I mean, you can't, some things are on fire and you have to deal with those, but um, where can I slow down and where can I have a little extra time and um, be thoughtful and deliberate about it and have a peaceful Wednesday or whatever, you know, with, you know, but still consider AI. I take time just to read about it. Like I'll set aside an hour that I'm just going to relax and read about it and not in different contexts. And that kind of helps me get different perspectives. It's, it sounds kind of corny, but it's just a way of me pacing myself through this. Cause I know it's like going to be a long ride and it's going to be really fun and exciting, yeah. but you can't sustain that forever. No, as you talk about this, I'm, we've all been like overwhelmed just by things for the last 10 yeah. or 20 years, well, just technology yeah, right. advancement, little pandemics and things like that. Um, and as you're talking about that, just that, cause one of my hopes is that the freneticness of the pace and the and the this the the way it's sucking all the oxygen out of the room is that people will come back to like we'll all could be coming up with our our peaceful one peaceful Wednesday um, uh, things you know that like we'll we'll each be coming back to that but um, it also seems like most many if not most of us still identify as content strategists and it seems like a very strategic approach to pace yourself and are you feeling that like with your like like since you started peaceful wednesdays are thursdays and fridays better every week they they are i mean they are when i practice it it's like it just kind of gets me through it gives you a, a nice time to re- your nervous system to recover um and yeah thinking about like the career stuff i was just talking about that with someone that you know I don't know how, I think it'll evolve, you know, but think how much we have evolved. I mean, content's always been changing. So it really is just kind of a normal part of sh- shifting your job. Now's a great time to sort of decide, like, how do I want that to evolve? I was thinking about, um, there have been times where you're like, could I lean, do I want to lean in more of a design direction or would I, 
I kind of sort of enjoy coding because it's similar to writing in a way. And so maybe I want to put my skills more towards that. And now's a great time to, you know, consider that and then make those choices and learn some different things, you know, or, you know, which path do I want to go on? Um, so I've been thinking about that a lot. And again, like the pacing is just like, I, you know, if you think about it, you're going you're gonna to be doing something that you love, like what's the essence of what you love to do? Like, what do I love about content? And like, you know, and I was thinking, I was like, I love putting, putting stories together or I love figuring out problems with words, which is often it's in a way a little bit more like programming if I wanted to do that, you know, so it's just kind of fun fi- figuring out like, what's the essence of what do I, what do I enjoy about this? Um, yeah, it does where, seem like, where does it in? yeah, it does seem like there's some opportunities for a reset. Like if you're, cause a lot of people, I know a lot of content designers who are a little bit stressed about the way things are right now. And, and one of the things that comes up, like many of the prior guests in the, like the 10 episodes leading up to this one have talked about the arrival of new jobs and new roles and new activities for which content people are perfectly suited. I don't know that there's codified yet as i mean we haven't even codified our old job roles so i'm not holding my breath waiting for this one to get codified but it seems like and again back to your peaceful wednesdays it's like just calm down keep breathing think about sit and and like you just said reflect on what really engages you and and nourishes you about the work and then look for opportunities and the new things that are arising yeah i just did this great i can't remember who hosted it. it was a survey about content um all the jobs that we do and all the things we do. And you, you're supposed to kind of check the ones that you had done. I was like, holy cow, I think I've done 75% of this list. Um, I have, it made me feel great. I was like, I have a lot of skills, you know, because I was a, I was a marketing copywriter. I mean, I was an advertising copywriter and then I moved into UX and I used to work in television and I wrote lower thirds, like t- where, where the person, you know, like so-and-so is at the scene of the crime. Like that was content, you know, um, so I've done a lot of different types of content over time. And when you get to reflect on that, you think, what parts did I love? And, you know, what, um, and how, and then you look at AI and wonder like, where does it need that thing? Uh, you know, like, um, I think prompt engineering is interesting. That might, that's, you know, there's going to be niches where you can really focus and find, but right now we can play and see what part energizes us. But, um, I mean, I've done long form, I've done short form. So I've done all the different things and, there's going to be something, a totally new way, like that long form will be done. And I mean, I mean, there's the, I think at the end of the day, we also, also think about our, our customers and the humans, right. That are consuming, consuming is kind of a weird word, but enjoying our work. Right. And um, what are they, what are they going to need? Like uh, you can also flip it to that and be like, what do I think they're going to need in the future? Will they, maybe they want more farming because they're tired of their VR headset and they want to go out and, you know, be the friendly farmer for real. And that's where I'm kind of wondering. That's my hope. And I read a book years ago called The Story of the Human Body by Daniel Lieberman, this uh, Harvard uh, evolutionary biologist. And one of the things he talks about in there is evolutionary mismatches, like that we evolved over this like long period of time, you know, and we're just hardwired for certain things. And I think that every advance in the digital age has kind of like, you know, created more of those mismatches. And at some point we'll just say, Oh, the heck with it. Every day's peaceful Wednesday. <laughs> Forget it. I'm out yeah. of here. Yeah. And you just try to have every day be like that. But hey, one day a week is good. One day a week is, is good to kind of take down the the anxiety of everything that's happening. And that's no, good. It, yeah, no. And I think when we <laughs> talked a little bit before about like pacing yourself, like that's enforced pace, like peaceful Wednesdays, just not going to stress. Yeah. Just not, not stress about it. And I mean, it's fun when you think about it. We're in this moment. I mean, it actually reflects today about being part of the whole streaming thing. Wow, that was cool. Now, you know, we're going to look back on this and be like, that was cool. You know, I got to be a part of that revolution. Yeah, that's something maybe we should all be thinking about. Like, again, that's one of those things where you step back, get perspective and think like, how do I, which part of this do I want to be remembered for? Um, Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know, I don't know how we pick that out at this stage of the game, but it's fun to think about. Yeah. And there's going to be those, you know, again, I love my my heroes that are jumping in there first that are going to be like, they're the ones who figured out the first thing, but, you know, failed at these things. And then you came in and failed at new things. Yeah. Well, I just love yeah. that there's room for all of us that like there's that we can all be anywhere along that adoption curve and still, you know, serving people. Because like you said a minute ago, it's like, it's all about like the, the human beings who are using this stuff. That's what it's all about. If it just becomes machines talking to each other. 
I'll join you on the farm. I'll be there. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. That is the truth. Um, Elizabeth, I can't believe it. we're coming up close to time already. Oh. Uh, is there anything last you wanted to say just that's come up in the conversation that you want to revisit or just that you want to make sure we share before we wrap up? So I have this one thing that I want to share and you might find this funny. It's a callback because we got connected because my friend Rebecca was uh, Rebecca Wynn is on the, on the podcast and she had said, that I didn't even remember having this conversation, but she was talking about, I need to get to see the table. And I was like, let that go. Forget about this table. I've been here about this table for 20 years. I'm I'm done with like the table. So I was watching, I I mean, speaking of streaming video, I'm obsessed with YouTube now. That's how I learn a lot of things. So I was watching like one of my astrologers or whatever that I follow on YouTube. And this great quote came up that said, um, it said, take your seat at your table. And I was like, oh, interesting. I'm going to take my seat at my table. And that's how I'm going to get like, I'm going to learn about AI because I'm going to take my seat and learn it from my perspective that is going to help me be a benefit to the work I do. And, you know, I don't know, it just it was a really interesting different, we keep talking about zooming out perspectives, but like, forget about the big table. What's my table like? And how do I want to be here? And how do I, what kind of seat do I want to have here? And then whatever that is will inform how I'm going to go help my company and my, my friends and family, like experience the future of technology or whatever way. That's fantastic. Cause the way you just said, it, it's not like the selfishly taking your table off in the corner, but it's more like putting your own oxygen mask on first so you can exactly. help other people. Yeah. So, so I've, I've been thinking about like, uh, Rebecca got me thinking like, yep, I'm going to take my seat at my own table and like, you know, empower myself to learn this stuff and, and pace myself, not burn myself out, um, and stress about it, but get good at it in the way that, uh, feels good to me. Nice. Yeah. And I think, again, that's back to human beings. We have to, uh, as well as serving our customers, we have to serve ourselves with what nourishes and, and, and sustains us. So. Yeah. So we got a long, a long ride. So like, let's get in there and have fun and, and make it through, you know? Yeah. No, that's the thing too. Your, your 20 year TV career is a great reminder that like, Hey, we're, this is chat GPT has been around about a year and a half. We got a long row ahead of us. Let's um, yeah, let's figure it out. Yeah. Hey, one very last thing, Elizabeth, what's the best way if folks want to follow you or connect online? What's the best way to reach you? Yeah. LinkedIn would be the best way to connect with me and that would be fun. We'd love to chat. Um, just to, I love to nerd out and talk about this stuff in this kind of Zen way. And it makes me, it helps me feel good and get to, yeah. and I love meeting other people. Cause like I said, it's, that's really key to us learning and, and kind of moving forward is to help each other learn it. Yeah. So please I connect. Say, I, I will definitely put that in the show notes as well. And I have to say, I love that. I didn't know this when we planned this, but we're recording this on a peaceful Wednesday. So that was, that seems really, I love that. So thanks so much. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Really fun conversation. Thank you. For show notes and to sign up for our newsletter, visit our website at contentandai.com. And please rate and review us on your favorite podcast platform. Thanks for listening.